to focus on kind of more of the science behind it, on how they're made, how we test them, um, and that aspect more so than the social issues of the ethics behind them and some of that stuff. But my email address will be at the end. If you're curious about kind of more of that aspect, you're more than welcome to send me emails that you have on them as well. Um, I also want to say that I'm, this whole presentation is not trying to sway you one way or another with regards to what your feelings or your thoughts are on GMOs. I really just kind of want to put what the current science um, has out there on it. So if you leave this talk saying, I didn't like GMOs at the beginning and I still don't, that's okay. If you swap, that's fine. It, it, whatever your personal feelings and thoughts are, that's okay. I'm not trying to sway you. I literally just want people to understand some of the basic science that's going on. So, with that, there you go. Okay, so with that, the first thing I want to do is talk about what exactly a GMO is and what I'm going to define a GMO as during this presentation. So a lot of times when people are asked what's a GMO, they say, I don't know, but it's bad. So <laughs> we're going to go ahead and just define it right off the bat. It's a genetically modified organism. So it's an organism, plant, animal, or microorganism that has been genetically modified in a way that does not occur naturally through mating or natural recombination. So this is not sweet potatoes, which have naturally had foreign DNA inserted into them sometimes hundreds of years ago that we take advantage of. This is not plants that we are crossbreeding. These are ones that we are actually doing genetic engineering in. So we are altering them in a way that is not likely going to happen in nature. Uh, some examples of organisms that we've done this with include bacteria, yeast, plants, and animals. Um, when you guys think of GMOs and genetic modification, I really want you to think of it as a tool more than anything else. Um, while it's being done in all of these various different organisms, uh, the aspect that we're going to talk about today in agriculture is only a very small piece of that. And I'm going to kind of talk about those other pieces first. Let me, sorry guys, always technical difficulty with this. Let me see if I can figure out how to get it to, there we go, advance. Okay, so bacteria are kind of one of the most common ones that we actually use for genetic modification. Um, they're cheap, they're easy to grow, they multiply quickly, they're easy to transform, and they can be stored. Um, they're used really heavily in the medical industry, so some of the first genetic modified organisms we had were bacteria to help make medicine for people, particularly things like insulin. Um, and this allowed cheap production, which unfortunately now to pharmaceutical companies is not quite as cheap, but it's literally made these kinds of things that humans need medication-wise available. Um, a lot of food products are made through bacteria, so this isn't so much what you would think of as a GMO crop, which we're going to talk about, but this would be things like enzymes and proteins and additives, so things that would help with um, preserving food or making juices less cloudy, so aesthetic things. Um, they're also pretty heavily being used now with regards to biofuels uh, as well. You also have two different yeasts that have been modified to help with the fermentation of wine. One of them is a taste one, so it makes the wine taste a little bit more sour. The other one is actually a yeast that helps to cut out um, a uh, compound called ethene carbonate, which is a toxin. So, and if it builds up too much in wine, it can make people sick. So, it's kind of, again, a little bit of that medical side going into it as well. So genetically modified plants uh, is kind of what everyone thought we were going to talk about, but these aren't crops. These are just normal plants. So the very first genetically modified plant was done back in 1983, and it was antibiotic-resistant tobacco. It never made it out of the laboratory. It was literally just two scientists trying to see if they could do it. Um, pretty much none of our genetically modified organisms have antibiotic resistance in them, at least none of the crops, um, and that's for a lot of health 
and kind of social issues. But in this case, they did it with a tobacco plant. You do have kind of ornamental flowers, things like these bright orange petunias. You have blue chrysanthemums. There's a rose that's a very nice lavender color that just got uh, genetically modified, and carnations are another one. And most of these plants are just an issue of they're trying to get these more bright, exuberant colors out of them. So it's very much an ornamental aspect. You do have a, a medical one as well. So carrots, surprisingly, not GMO'd as a crop, but they have been modified, at least the root cells, to help generate um, a medicine that's used for gout. Um, so there's an enzyme that if people with gout get, they can help digest their food a little bit easier. Um, and it just improves the quality of life. So they found that carrot root cells particularly are really easy to insert this gene into to generate this enzyme, and then they kind of harvest the enzyme out of the carrot root cells. So really neat science there. There's a really cool paper on it. If you're really interested, reach out to me and I'll get you a copy of it. OK, so we don't normally think of genetically modified animals as much. But we do have a fair amount of them. Most of these are done in kind of a more of a lab setting. Specifically, a lot of them have to do with human diseases. So the green fluorescent pigment, which you'll see is on the picture of the really cute cat here. This is a, uh, an animal that's modified a lot in research that they're doing in Japan, particularly targeting studying HIV. Cats have a, a feline version of HIV that can't get transmitted to humans. But through using this kind of green fluorescent uh, protein, they can attach it onto various different other things and track where these proteins and these genes are within these animals. Um, you also have the production of drugs and other pharmaceuticals being used in animals, um, enrichments with regards to things like the glowfish. So again, that's that gene uh, fluorescent protein getting put in literally just to make a really cute pet for your kids. Um, you have a handful of examples of when we've used genetic modification to kind of help uh, animals combat diseases. The most specific one I can think of is there is a small ground rabbit in the UK that was on the endangered species list because it was dying from a virus. So they basically created a, a, a vaccine GMO version of it and then released it back out into the wild and it kind of bred and the population is starting to grow back off of that. And then you do have the uh, encourage of food quality traits. So in this case, the new GMO fish, which is a um, salmon down here in the corner, and both of those fish are the same age. One of them has an additional three growth genes that causes it to grow a lot quicker. So and I do not recall if that one has been approved for market or yet. If it is, it's the latest, it's the latest GMO to hit market. Um, so what you guys were probably thinking of when you talk about GMOs is genetically modified crops. So this is what we're, the bulk of the rest of this talk is going to be on. So 490, 469 million acres of GMO crops are planted worldwide. They're grown in 24 different countries and imported into another 38 countries. The United States makes up 40% of all of that worldwide. Um, out of those 24 countries, you have a breakdown of both developed and industrial company countries. So places like the United States, like Canada, but then you also have what would be considered more third world countries um, or countries that are in the process of developing, they might be that in that transitioning stage that are using this technology to really kind of jump up their agricultural production. Here in the United States, uh, corn, soybean, and cotton are the three most commonly grown genetically modified crops. Um, a lot of the ones that are modified that are also commonly grown here are mainly used a lot in our processing or in our animal feeds. So corn, soybean, um, Canola and sugar beets are both genetically modified or have genetic modified version, and they're pretty much exclusively used for processing. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have kind of a timeline of genetically modified crops um, with regards to the United States. So uh, soybeans and squash 
uh, were kind of the first two. Um, some of the dates, it's one of those things where they stretch sort of when you look them up. So squash had some sites uh, locking it as early as 1995, others put it in 1996. Corn, cotton soon followed, the papaya in 97, canola, and then there was this long gap when we didn't have a lot of modified crops coming in before the 2000s when the alfalfa sugar beet hit the market. And then again, there's another kind of gap going on there. And then the newest ones to kind of hit the market are the potato and the Arctic apple. Um, some GMO crops that you're not going to find here in the U.S., eggplant. Um, this one is common only to Bangladesh. Uh, wheat is grown in Australia, New Zealand, but you're not going to find it here. Sugarcane is in Indonesia. Sweet peppers are grown in China, and then there is talk about a genetically modified rice also. I believe that one is potentially getting approved in China. Um, there had been talk about having uh, genetically modified tobacco and tomatoes on the market. These got pulled at some point, either because of lack of consumer interest or because they just didn't meet qualifications for testing. But those ones are no longer available. Um, the next uh, known GMO that's probably going to hit our market is going to be a plum, um, and it's a disease-resistant plum. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but if you are interested, there's definitely resources online that you can find out about. <coughs> okay, so what types of genetic modifications have been done to this crop. So the most common ones that people think of when they think of GMOs is probably the herbicide tolerant and the insect resistant. So I'll abbreviate for the most of this talk as those HT and BT. We also have some that are disease resistant, mainly the papaya and the squash. Uh, drought stress is one that's kind of been put on some crops but it's one that's definitely people are starting to take notice of, particularly with kind of the advancing climate change issues coming on us. You can also have uh, nutritional enhancing seeds, um, as well as consumer or product enhancement in general. Um, if you are someplace and people talk about stacked seeds, which is becoming more and more common, these are uh, genetically engineered or GMO crops that have more than one of these traits. So particularly something like corn, you might find herbicide tolerance and insect resistance. Um, there are varieties that would be one or the other, but then there are varieties that will be both. So here is a breakdown on those crops that are found here in the United States and what they're modified for. Um, so again, corn, or first one up, soybean, you have herbicide tolerance, and then you also have a consumer one, which is a it's a higher oil content one, and that one specifically is grown for processing. Squash is disease resistant. Corn, you have herbicide, insecticide, and environmental stress, so it's a drought stress corn. Uh, cotton is herbicide and insect. Uh, papaya is just a disease. Uh, a lot of your, your following grains and processing, so canola, alfalfa, and sugar beet are all herbicide. The arctic apple, which is the non-browning apple, is straight up just for consumer enhancement at this point. There's a patent pending on it for some other uh, potential modification, but most of them are all going to be geared towards a consumer side and less towards the agricultural growth aspect. And then the potato um, is, again, it's a disease resistant one that also has a non-browning effect to it. So the one thing I want you guys to kind of really get out of this is not all GMOs are the same. So when someone says, you know, uh, GMOs are this or GMOs are that, it's hard to put them all in the same category because as you can see, they have this huge diversity in the purpose that they're meant to fulfill with the modification. Okay. So before I dive any more really into how GMOs are made, I kind of want to take a few minutes to do some basic bio review. I know for some people you may have just had a bio class, whether it's in high school or in college. For other people it may have been a few years. So we're going to just take a few moments to kind of review some key terms that I'm going to talk about. The first one being DNA. So this is a, a 
synonym for diribonic acid. Um, so this is your, what's found in the nucleus of cells. It's the building blocks of life. Um, I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but all living things have DNA. Um, one of the things that I always sort of hear is people say, well, I hate GMOs. I don't want to eat things that have DNA. Well, if it's alive, it has DNA. Um, DNA is a double helix made up of nucleotides. They match up in pairs. So uh, guanine and cytosine match up, and then thymine and adenine match up. You can see over here on the picture. So it's basically just a double helix. This is basically, I like to think of DNA as a library. It holds lots and lots of information, um, instructions basically for cellular growth, development, functioning, and reproduction. So everything that your body needs on a cellular level to function is packed into this. So it's a massive library of information. So RNA is kind of like the uh, stepchild of DNA. It's made out of nucleotides as well, but it's commonly only found as one strand. It's normally folded on itself. By folding on itself and doubling up, it kind of stays uh, around in the cells a little bit longer. RNA is not. Um, particularly sturdy, so it, it oftentimes gets broken up and broken down by the cell really quickly if it's not folded in that cell or if it doesn't have proteins kind of hanging on to it. But it plays kind of this middleman role um, of coding, decoding, regulating, and gene expression. So we'll talk about proteins in a second, but it's one of those things where DNA is really the instruction booklet and proteins are the people doing it, so RNA works as the middleman between the two. So when we talk about a gene, what we're actually talking about is kind of more of a conceptual idea. It's a sequence of DNA in larger organisms such as ourselves and plants, or RNA if we're talking about viruses, that basically codes for a specific trait or function. So uh, you'll oftentimes have multiple genes that will help code for the same thing. So like your eye color is not one gene, it's multiple genes, but each one together works. I like to, if you think of this again as kind of the DNA being the library, the gene is like a book in the library. It would be blueprints or instructions that RNA or proteins, the workers, can basically use. Not all of it codes for something to be made, but some of it will work as a coder for a signal. So if, you know, if you are in a library looking for a book on how to do something, some of it is, would also be the sign that tells you this is the function where you would find that information. And we are still in the areas of learning new things about genes, so there are certain genes that we still don't know the functions of. Um, they seem like areas in genomic materials where they're empty, and we're sure that they're probably either remnants of something that had a purpose, or they just have a purpose and we haven't found them out yet. So that takes me to proteins. Um, so these are one or more long chains of amino acids, and an amino acid is just a micronutrient. You find them in your body. Um, these are really the workers in your cells. So they perform a wide array of functions um, within an organism. So they're really much the workers. So think of this again. If you had a library with books, these would be the librarians. They're the sorting of the books. They're running around. But this is also the entire community around the library. So this is, you know, the, the custodial workers and uh, the bus drivers and everything. So in your body, in your cells, these are basically the things that are actually doing a lot of the work. So they're moving things around, they're replicating the DNA, they're fighting off uh, bad, they're the antibodies against diseases, they're sending various different signals to all throughout your body. Um, the ones that we really want to focus on are enzymes. Um, so you can think of this as like tape or scissors. What they basically do is they work to speed up chemical reactions. And it's not just any chemical reaction, they're highly specific and accurate chemical reactions. So I like to almost think of this as kind of the crafting scissors that you can buy, where they don't cut a straight line, but they'll cut a decorative thing, and each pair will cut something different. 
So that's what these guys do. They either bring substances together, like the picture in here is showing, to produce a product, or they can break products apart to make substances, which would be scissors. So think of them as tape or scissors in that case. The important thing to remember about them is that they are highly specific. So it's not like one protein um, can do lots of tasks. They are pretty much one task only kind of deal. And your body has thousands and millions of different proteins doing lots of different tasks. One of the other things to remember about them is that they do denature or break apart with heat or pH changes. So these are not necessarily permanent in any way, shape, or form. They can get used up and then broken apart and then put back together and so forth. So they are sort of interchanging. Okay, so with that, we're gonna kind of jump into how GMO crops are made and kind of what the basic process of them are. So if you were a seed company and you wanted to make a genetically modified crop, how would you kind of go about doing it? And the first thing that you're going to want to do is just identify a desirable trait. Um, what genes do you want and where do you want them? What animals or what plants in this case do you want them part of? And then based off of that, you need to evaluate, do you need to genetically modify them or can you do selective breeding? Um, a great example is people oftentimes think we've come really far with our wheat production and all of that has been done through selective breeding and crossbreeding. We don't have genetically modified wheat here in the United States. Um, they have it over in Australia and New Zealand and some other countries, but we don't grow it here. We don't consume it here either. Um, so selective breeding is still being used. Uh, if you decide that you need to genetically modify something for, in order to get this desired trait that you want, the next thing you have to do is figure out how to isolate those specific genes. And this can take lots of time. Um, you need to go through the entire genome of both the plant that you want to modify and both the organism whose gene you want to take. You need to figure out where it is and you need to figure out exactly how to get it out. Once it's out, you need to transfer it into your desired plant. And we're going to talk a lot more about this step in a sec. And then once that's actually done, you need to test to make sure that it got into the plant, that it's in the right place, and then you're going to involve a breeding process because you don't want to bottleneck these new crops. So you need to add more genetic diversity into it and make sure that this gene is being carried over if you want it to be carried over. Okay, so how do you go about doing gene transfer? So there's four main ways that we can go about doing gene transfer. So uh, electroporous and microinjection are both kind of older methods that were used where scientists would kind of isolate that DNA and then <clears throat> they would either electrocute cells really quickly and kind of um, expose them to this new gene or this new piece of DNA with the hopes that when they electrocuted it, it would open up the pores and then the DNA would get moved into the nucleus and then somehow would get incorporated in or would get transcribed while just randomly in the nucleus. Um, Microinjection kind of follows the same idea. You're putting DNA on these very long spindles you can see in the picture and then you're shaking them up with a bunch of cells hoping that these spindles will puncture not only the cell but the nucleus getting that DNA in there. The two more common methods that we come, that we use now are gene guns and agrobacterium. So those ones I'm going to talk about a little bit more in detail. So this is a gene gun, and a lot of people would, um, just like kind of the name implies, it gets the DNA into plant cells by shooting it. So what you do is you take a very thin kind of layer of gold or tasinga, which are just elements, and you cover it with millions of copies of this desired gene. Um, you then place it in a vacuum, and then using high-pressure gas, you shoot it into the plant cell. Um, so if you look up here at the picture with the finger, the, the plates would go up on the top, and then air would come through them, and then they have an onion leaf in the petri dish in the bottom that these genes would then get shot into with the hopes that they are getting into the tissue and then once they're in the tissue, you could then propagate out the plant and you could test to see if they were there or not. Um, the downside of this method is that the DNA has to get through the cell wall and through the membrane um, 
without necessarily rupturing the cells or doing unsuitable harm to the plant where they're not going to work. And then it's an issue of you have to figure out how to get it integrated into the actual DNA of the plant sometimes in order to get it transcribed and being used. So it works much better than the other methods, but it still has a little bit of kind of torque tweaking to go with it with regards to you can't be very specific about where that gene goes in the nucleus, um, which some of these other methods you can be now. So agrobacterium is kind of a newer method and it's uh, really commonly used in pretty much everything now. And what they basically have is we have a bacterium, agrobacterium thermophysella, um, which has this extra little plasmid, which you can see is this circle up on the screen, Ooh. No. there you go. Um, we call it a TI plasmid. Now, in plant cells, this bacteria um, puts this in to, it. so what this bacteria will do is it will infect a plant through some site of scar, and then once it's in, it will take this plasmid and it will uh, release it out into plant cells. The plasmid will open up, it will transcribe the little bit of DNA that it wants to go into the genome, which is the orange. It will also transcribe some proteins that will help that DNA piece cross into the plant's nucleus and then get incorporated into its genome or into the plant's DNA. Once it's done this, the plant will actually start making food for the bacteria to eat. Um, this doesn't cause the plant to die, but it definitely takes up some of the plant's resources. Um, what genetic engineers have basically done is they've taken the TI plasmid and they've gotten rid of the genes that the bacteria want and they've put in the genes that they want. They've also gotten rid of some of the um, toxins that also come in with it. Um, agrobacteria is known to cause galls on plants because it causes the cells to kind of multiply um, and they've gotten rid of all of the kind of uh, stuff like that. So they're basically just using the TI plasmid as a transportation tool. So they've made it fairly straightforward and easy. This is how most of your genetic modification um, has happened. What you've probably heard a lot of in the news lately is CRISP technology. So this is kind of a newer technology um, that is probably going to make genetic modification much, it's much easier to do um, and it's much more specific. So what you basically have is a very specific enzyme called the Cas9 enzyme, which will go in and it will cut DNA at a very specific location. And you can tell it exactly what that location is by giving it a little bit of RNA. It will match this piece of RNA up with the DNA that you're trying to cut. And once they match up, it knows exactly where to cut. Once it's done that cut, it has the option of adding or deleting a piece of that genomic DNA, or it can add in a new gene in that case as well. So this is really neat because it's allowing for the turning on, turning off, or up and down of genes. So you can say right off the bat, we don't want this gene functioning at all, or you can say we want this gene to function more, or we want it still to be here and to be functional, but we just don't want it to function as much. So you can tweak genes in a lot of different ways. Um, this is heavily being looked at a lot in the biomedical field, specifically to take on some of the genetic diseases that we have. It's definitely something that has been considered with genetically modified crops, but none of the market are used. Um, it was used by a professor at Penn State to make a non-browning mushroom, which is why there's a picture of a mushroom here. Um, he has not taken it to the commercial market yet, so if you go to your grocery store, you're not going to find non-browning mushrooms. He uh, enjoys working for Penn State, and basically he's gotten through uh, the process but has not decided to go take up mushroom farming. The one thing about uh, CRISP technology is because, particularly with the browning mushroom, no outside genes were added. He simply cut uh, some genes that were there to prevent it from browning, this doesn't actually count as a genetically modified organism. So when he went to go through the process of putting in a patent, a lot of our regulatory places that I'll talk about, so FDA, EPA, USDA, 
basically said this isn't a GMO, we don't need to regulate this. So because of this technology, I think we're going to have to open up a whole new conversation about when we are tweaking genes but not adding a new one, the kind of the issues that can evolve around this. Okay, so at this point, um, I'm going to pause and see if we have any questions before I talk about how they work. I'm not hearing anything from Kim or Taylor. Sorry, I was on mute. I don't think we have any questions in the chat box, but if anyone would like to submit a question, please do so in the chat box and just remember to select all participants. Thanks, Emily. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to keep going then. If you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in, um, and I'll answer any at the end. If it involves going back to this. So how do these actual uh, modified crops work was kind of the next big question that I always get asked by people. So that's the next one I want to talk about. And again, I'm not going to talk about all of them because they are very diverse in how they work, but I'm going to focus on kind of three of them. So the first one I want to talk about is how the herbicide tolerance GMO crop works. So again, plants have enzymes, which are proteins that do specific tasks. Um, and a lot of them will make things like amino acids, which I have represented as all the bright colorful little triangles, um, or other compounds that they need to survive. So things like hormones um, and so forth, or growth regulators and so forth. Herbicides uh, will come in and target these enzymes specifically. Um, and when they do that, you can see that herbicides are the red things. They tend to break up these enzymes. They'll denature them somehow. And this will basically cause the plant to reduce the uh, amino acids or the survival or growth hormones that it needs. So over time, the plant will use those up, and then at some point, the plant will die. This is one of those reasons why a lot of times you'll apply an herbicide and then it takes it a few days before the plant actually dies, is because it's using up all of this other stuff and then it dies. What happens when you have a GMO crop is you basically made some of whatever enzyme or hormone that the herbicide is targeting, you've given this crop another option. So in this case, we've given them an enzyme that the herbicide's not going to interact with. And those are the ones that are in the lighter blue and they have the enzyme plus on them. So these are enzymes that have been modified. So when the herbicides attack, it'll break up the normal enzymes, but not these. So then the plant will continue to make the amino acids that it needs and will continue to grow and survive. I do want to be clear here that none of these herbicide tolerant GMOs make herbicides. Um, they are modified in order to break down herbicides or to tolerate herbicides. None of them make herbicides. So, okay. So the next. GMO, then I want to talk about how it works is the insect resistant one. So pretty much all of these involve uh, Bt, which is the soil bacteria. It's very commonly found. It's uh, widely acceptable as a great use for pest control. It's commonly used in organic things like this container up here for the caterpillar. It's also commonly used in mosquito dunk. Um, they are very kind of host specific in the variety, so you can get some that will target caterpillars, some will target beetles, and some will target fly larvae. What they basically do is uh, this bacteria will make a specific protein that we call an insecticidal uh, proposal crystal protein, or an ICP. So what happens is these proteins get digested by an insect, and because insects have an alkaline gut, this will break the protein up into toxins. So, and the toxins are being represented here by the little orange stars. And then these toxins will interact with the gut of the insect and they create holes or pores. This will allow for um, the kind of the gut uh, intestines will seep out a little bit, but this will also just upset, upset the insect's stomach. And this 
basically stops the insect from eating, and it will eventually starve to death, or if these poles are large enough, the, the gut things will kind of biodegrade it from the inside out. So the last major one that I want to talk about is how disease resistance works in GMO crops. So this is the one that's found in squash and papayas and potatoes, and particularly all of our disease resistance GMOs are all targeted towards viruses. Um, most viruses are transmitted by insects in these cases. Um, so a virus is basically a protein shell with either a piece of DNA or RNA inside. It needs a cell uh, of a host in order to reproduce, so it doesn't have the capacity to reproduce on its own. So what they end up doing is they insert their gene, so their DNA or their RNA, into a cell. In this case, we're going to talk about plants, so it's the plant cells, and they make the plant cell use up all of its resources, making new DNA for the virus and then new proteins for the virus's shell. So the cell uses up all of its resources making stuff for the virus and basically starves itself to death. Um, what the genetically modified version does is it inserts a single gene that would code for part of the protein of the virus shell. By putting it in there, the cell is going to make a very small amount of just this general protein that it can kind of just use, it will end actually end up breaking it down and reusing the components. But what happens then is when the plant gets infected with the virus, the actual genome looks at it and goes, wait, I'm only supposed to have a little bit of you. Why do I have so much of you? Turn it, turn it all off. So they basically will go and turn off the engineered gene as well as the virus genes that have been infected. So you can kind of think of this as though the same way we vaccinate for a lot of our diseases by building up an immune system, it's the same process that's happening here. Okay. So, so now I want to talk about testing um, and how we go about kind of testing these GMOs once we have, once companies have kind of made them and they're ready to kind of put them out in the market, what sort of testing has to get done for them. So here in the United States, we have three regulatory agencies that really kind of work very closely with GMOs and getting them to the point where they can be on the market or denying them from being on the market. So that would be the United States Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the United States Food and Drug Administration. And each one of them does a very distinctly different role with regard to GMOs. Um, sometimes they'll have a lot of overlap in kind of the tests that they want to see, but the roles and what they're specifically looking for are different. One thing that I think is really important for people to understand about GMOs is that when we're, when they're testing for GMOs, they're not testing to see if the GMO is safe. They're testing to see if the GMO is the same as the non-GMO version is with regards to human health, animal health, the environment. Um, the food we eat has millions and dozens of plant toxins and all sorts of other things. They're in very, very small amounts, so when we eat them, they go right through our system. But if you were checking to see if it was safe, and you were like, well, why am I coming up with all these things that are known to be toxic? Um, they're naturally found in the crop or the plant or the fruit itself. So it's kind of this idea of we're going to test to see how different it is from the non-GMO version. Um, if you, I'm going to kind of do quick overviews of all this testing. If you really want some specific diehard, um, the coordinated framework for regulation of biotech is kind of the guideline for the United States and for mostly for Canada as well. The European Union has their own with regards to it, and I believe some of the other countries also have their own, but this is kind of the United States guidebook to how biotech is regulated here in the United States. It was just recently updated um, in 2016, and then they had an opening comment period, and it's closed, and then the process of, I think it's actually, it's out now. So it closed and then they published it right at the end of 2017. So you can type that into Google and you can pull it up. Um, it is a very technical document though. Um, so it's not light reading by any means, but if you really want the nitty gritty of it all, um, it is there. <coughs> okay, 
So the first of the three kind of agencies that I want to talk about is the FDA. And it's evaluating for the safety of genetically engineered crops as food and feed for animals. So it's not looking at anything besides, is this as safe to eat as a non-modified crop? So the initial step would be a consulting phase with FDA. So if you were a seed producing company um, that wanted to modify this, you would make an appointment with FDA, you would sit down, you'd propose to them what your, um, what your crop did, how it was modified, and then they, based off of that, would get back to you with basically a test assessment. So what tests do they need to justify the safety of this crop? So this is where it goes back to not all GMOs are the same. And based on not only the crop that you're doing, but the modifications are going to dictate the different types of tests that FDA and EPA and USDA are going to need. So once that was done, the testing would partake. Now, the government does not do any of the testing. Most of this testing is done either by the seed company itself or the seed company is paying for a third party person to do it. So this could be a, an independent company, this could be someone at a university, um, or this could be someone housed in-house. Once all that testing is done, they will then submit another report to FDA. FDA will look over all of this stuff. They'll identify any things that they don't feel are unresolved or any uh, issues that would arise in it or any kind of legal issues that would be constrained. Um, once they'll then submit this back um, to the company, they have can resolve them. And then if it's all resolved and FDA approves it, they'll issue what they call a letter um, to the developer. And that basically says that they have FDA's consent to release it, however, they are responsible for maintaining the safety of their crop. Um, so if something were to change and it was to become unsafe, it would be their responsibility to pull it off the market and so forth. Um, one of the nice things that has happened through the genetic engineering um, kind of revamp that has happened is uh, all of these industries have gotten a lot better about being open about this kind of stuff. So when, when a product or a GMO crop is going through this process, it's closed book. But as soon as FDA has issued this letter, it becomes public knowledge. So all of this goes up on their website and it can all be found in the biotech consideration on food for GE plant variables, which is off here. Um, I know that's a lot to say, but you would click on this website and then you could click on, it's a long list of all of them, so you'd click on one. So this is a patent for soybeans um, by Bass, um, and it's an herbicide resistant one. And then you would go down and down here at FDA meme, you would click on it, and then here's the entire document, or it's, it's basically a summary of what FDA got. Um, so you're not going to have raw data in here, but you're going to have a summary of the tests that they conducted and the results that they got um, that FDA used to justify that this was okay for human and animal consumption. So again, most of these are super technical documents, great nighttime reading if you really want to clunk yourself out. But again, it's there and it's available now, which I think is a really great move considering when GMOs were first hitting the market and no one would share any information on them. So what are the major concerns that FDA and people in general have about the safety of eating GMO foods? So there's four main things that FDA in particular is really conscious about when it comes to whether or not these foods are safe for people. Um, one is the toxicity of these crops. So are they making any sort of toxins that the plant itself isn't making? Are they interfering with the genes um, and disturbing the natural gene regulation that's leading to kind of more production of something? Again, all of these plants have natural toxins in them. A lot of them uh, are benefits to us. Um, things like antioxidants are made as a toxin towards something else, but it's a benefit to humans. So they're all kind of naturally there. But we want to make sure, again, that a GMO um, squash has the same toxicity levels as a non-GMO squash. Um, they also want to make sure that there's no adverse nutrient changes. So again, that GMO squash has just as much 
iron and calcium and um, nutritional benefit as the non-GMO. So horizontal gene transfer is another one that is kind of something that people have arised. You're, you know, this idea of, well, we're putting a gene in, how do we make sure that gene's not coming back out and isn't cross-contaminating us? So there's lots of studies that have kind of gone into this. Um, as well, at this point, pretty much all the studies have shown that your body doesn't know the difference, so it's digesting it the same way that it would digest DNA and genes that are coming into your body. Um, the main one that tends to be the largest focus is the allergenic reaction. So most of these GM crops are making an extra protein, and proteins are not likely to be toxic. Pretty much most proteins are not toxic, um, but they are likely to be an allergen. On most of these foods that you see in this picture here that people have an allergy to, they don't have an allergy to the DNA, they have an allergy to a protein that's being made. So the allergy is to lactose, or it's to a protein in peanuts, or to a, you know uh, the chitin protein in shellfish. So it's a protein. So that's kind of one of the biggest things that FDA definitely emphasizes on something that's going to be consumed by humans that's not being processed is an allergy test. <clears throat> so what are some tests that FDA would ask for in order to make sure that you're checking all four of these sort of concerns that they have. So the first is that they want a thorough study on how this new gene works. And this is, again, they want to go back to the, is it having an adverse effect on nutrients, or is it making something toxic? Is it preventing something? All of that. Um, they would want you to compare the nutrients um, and other compounds from the traditional bread with the GMO. So again, is it basically the same when it comes to vitamin A, vitamin D, C, iron, calories, all of that kind of stuff. Um, they'll oftentimes ask you to do a gastric simulation. Um, and this is basically when you're going to take the, the, either the, the proteins itself or the actual GMO food itself, and you're going to expose it to digestive acids and enzymes that you would find in a human stomach. And you're going to see how long it takes to bio for those to break it down. Um, scientifically speaking, if it takes less than 90 seconds, the probability of it being an allergen decreases dramatically. Most things that are allergies to people, it's because something in their digestive system doesn't allow it to break down quickly. So that's how it becomes an allergy. So the other things that they will do is they'll test all of these proteins for allergies. And a lot of that is done through a feeding test. Um, at the FDA level, this is mainly done through rats and mice, although it can kind of scale up to larger animals as needed. Um, oftentimes, it starts out with a specific compound, so again, that protein, and then later on can become a whole food feeding test as needed. But there's certain complications when you move to a whole food test versus a protein, individual one, in that you can't scale them up, per se. I can expose a rat to 10 times the amount of the protein the food would have by isolating the protein and mixing it into its food. I can't get a rat to eat 10 times more food than a rat would normally eat. Um, not to mention then you have an adverse effect of when you're feeding something a mono diet. Um, so there's kinds of, there's benefits to both because then you, you want the whole picture, so you want the whole food, but sometimes that's also not plausible either. Okay, so the question everyone really wants to know is, are they safe for people and humans, uh, for people and animals to eat? And current science says, yeah, they're as safe as the non-GMO counterpart. So a GMO squash is just as safe as a non-GMO squash. Uh, GMO sweet corn is just as safe as non-GMO sweet corn. Um, there was a massive study in 2016 by the National Academic of Science Engineers and uh, medicine report. Uh, again, this is another free thing that you can find online. It's about 700 pages, but you can read through it. Uh, they basically got experts in the field of science and engineering and medicine and health in the environment to kind of sit down and do some massive reviews of all the research that had been done. And they basically concluded that GMOs from, at this point, are safe for humans and animals to consume. Um, 
There's also some other papers out there. One that I really like specifically that talks about animals is this one, the health effects of feeding uh, genetically modified crops to livestock. This was a, a review, so it's not a study itself. It's someone who went around and looked at them. Um, and he looked at about 37 different livestock feeding operations um, spanning cows, pigs, and chickens, and kind of looked at the results of those. And out of the ones he looked at, 50% showed some sort of health effect happening when they were getting fed GMOs, but they weren't always negative effects. There was just something happening that was slightly more or less in some of them. But the point that I kind of want to make with bringing this up is that we're saying that they're safe, but you're always going to find studies that are counterintuitive with each other. Part of science is just that. So someone, two people can do the exact same experiment and someone can say, I found, you know, result A and someone else can say, that's wrong, I found B. That's kind of just unfortunately how science works. So I think when it comes to the safety of GMOs, we're constantly going to see feeding studies happening. Um, and again, it goes back to the, when you're doing livestock animal feeding things and you're specifically only feeding them the GMO or the non-GMO, you're restricting their diet down to one specific crop so that you can potentially have health benefits that are cumulative from a lack of a nutritious diet or from something else. So there's kind of give and takes when it comes to all of this kind of aspect of it. Okay, so now we're going to move on to EPA. Um, so EPA plays kind of a very unique particular role when we're talking about genetically engineered crops in that EPA regulates pesticides. Um, so under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodicide Act, they are required to regulate anything that counts as a pesticide. So anything that kills what would be dubbed as a pest. So they specifically are going to look at genetically modified crops with a pesticide element. So this would be the insecticide resistant uh, crops, the herbicide tolerant ones, and the disease resistant ones. If they don't fall under those, EPA doesn't look at them. So EPA is not going to look at a drought tolerant corn um, because it doesn't have a pesticidal element to it. That's not to say that that won't get looked at someplace else. But that's not what EPA's kind of role is in this. Um, when it comes to the studies that they want, they want, want to make sure that it's not a risk to human health. So again, we're going to have a lot of overlap there with FDA. Um, they specifically really have raised the bar on wanting non-target organisms and environmental risk assessments. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, when they are looking at something, does it need to have a resistant management plan? This is, again, something newer that's come in um, from the initial uh, batch of GMOs that have come out, as we've noticed resistance building up. So is there a need for it? Does it need to be established? How do farmers need to incorporate it? Um, they also look at the potential gene flow. Um, and this is gene flow looking between agricultural crops and native crops that would be around the field. So this is not so much corn to corn, like my corn versus my neighbor's corn. This is my corn versus the predecessor of corn that's growing in, you know, the abandoned lot over kind of deal. Um, so some common tests that they're going to look at, that the EPA is going to want, is the identification of the new gene and all the new proteins. Uh, they're going to want a mammalian toxicity test with all the new proteins. So again, this is likely going to be um, a rodent feeding trial with the proteins um, likely on their own, potentially a, a further one where it's the whole compound. Um, they're going to want a comparison of the protein and the toxins in the GMO and the non-GMO. They're also going to want that non-target effect. So based on the GMO that you're making and the likelihood of it being toxic, they may pick one or several of these non-targets to look at. So they may not, you may or may not need to look at birds, fish, earthworms, or a representative insect. Um, one of the other requirements is that they really want the length of time that this protein is going to be in the environment. So how long outside of this organism or as this organism is breaking down, is this protein still viable in the environment? So uh, when it comes to the non-target invertebrate risk assessment, EPA actually has a pretty good protocol in place that's open for the public to see. So they use what we call a four-tier system for it, where they're really looking at the toxicity of 
kind of this new add-on to um, beneficials is really where this came from. So a picture, you know, like this honeybee over here, you might also see people doing it with something like lace wings or ladybird beetles. But the idea is when it comes to toxicity is that's a component of both the hazard and the exposure. So as soon as EPA has dubbed that something is safe with one tier, they don't necessarily require the uh, company to move through all four tiers. But if, um, if they have to, they'll continuously move down to all four. And if it can't pass all four, then they kind of don't give it a stamp of approval. So the first test is basically this worst case scenario where with regards to toxicity, we're talking about high hazard, low kind of exposure. So it's a constant 10 times the concentration of the protein that you would find out in the environment being fed to this organism. So if this protein is going to kill this organism, this is the study that's going to show it. Um, if there's any possibility of it doing it, it's going to do this. Once that's kind of established, that worst case scenario, um, they'll move it down to kind of feeding plant tissues, to kind of a longer uh, lifetime study, and then eventually into field trials if needed. So again, if I take, you know, and I can use the BT protein because people have done this study. So if I take that BT protein and I feed it to honeybees um, at 10 times the concentration they'll find out in nature and it doesn't kill them, I don't need to continue down the rest of these tiers because I've already showed at the max concentration they would ever get exposed to, it's okay. So under EPA's rulings, that would be enough to stop. If I were to do this and it was to kill some of them, um, then they may say, okay, we want a longer term study where you want, you know, to expose them to it, not just the protein, but, you know, the protein in the pollen. Um, and again, you'd work your way down. Uh, the protocol for all this is up on EPA's website. So again, it's another big long document, but if you want to read through it, it's available for the public. So USDA is kind of the obvious uh, agency that people would think does a lot with GMO crops, and it does. So each one of these kind of divisions under USDA has some sort of component with regards to GMO crops. I'm not going to take the time to talk about all of them because we're actually at the hour mark right now, but I'm going to emphasize kind of the two ones that are in bold because they are the main players when it comes to the regulation of getting, of letting GMO crops be in the market. Um, so the Agricultural Research Service can actually partake in biotech research. They're not likely going to do research for a company or nor are they going to double check on like a company's research unless there's a significant reason. But for instance, like the GMO papaya was helped to come about because of the Agricultural Research Service. So they themselves can partake in biotech research. Um, APHIS is kind of the more regulatory side of the USDA with regards to GMOs. And what they're basically looking at is um, does this biotech propose a risk to agricultural plants and animals. So they're not necessarily looking at does it propose a risk to that wild meadow that EPA was worried about. They're worried about does this propose a risk to your neighbor's corn or to corn plants in general or to this. So they're looking at it more on an on-farm kind of thought process. If you were a tech company that was ready to take it to a field trial, particularly for, like, if you needed to do the field trial for EPA, or if you wanted to do a, how does this work out in the field, what's the growth capacity and all that, you need to go to APHIS for a permit for that, and they regulate that as well as its movement. Um, so with regards to that, they have a fair amount of regulations of, okay, you know, it has to be done, you know, is it safe enough to go out? They might ask you to do kind of a greenhouse study first, um, and if not, then you know, once that was shown to be safe, they'd let you go out to a field. They'd have requirements about the length between this crop and other ones. You may have to plant up barriers of switchgrass and other things. Um, again, all of these protocols are up online under documents. Um, another huge, you know, 100-page documents, but you can go ahead and find them if you're really curious. Um, and again, their idea here is to determine whether a genetically engineered organism is safe for, as safe in the environment as its non-GMO counterparts. So they're not necessarily contemplating, you know, what's the difference between 
you know, um, they're they're looking to see if they're they're similar enough. So, is there a significant difference between the GMO and the non-GMO when it comes to risk of uh, agriculture and animals in there? Um, well, okay. So that kind of transitions us into GMO crops and the environment. Um, so this is kind of one of the very controversial things about GMOs, and it's not one that I am actually going to spend a lot of time talking about because we're basically over on time, and I really wanted to focus a lot on that other kind of regulatory stuff. There's a lot of good papers and talks out there about kind of this. Um, GMOs in the environment have a very mixed relationship with each other. There's both good and bad components with GMO crops when it comes to the environment. Um, mainly they involve around pesticides, and we'll talk about that in a sec. The one thing I want to say is if you decide to put GMO crops on your farm, you should be part of your integrated pest management plan, but it shouldn't be your only aspect of your integrated pest management plan. You can't say, well, I planted GMO sweet corn, so I can just walk away. You, you need to take into aspect a lot of the other components. Um, it's a piece of it. It can't be the entire thing. Um, this is a super complex thing. Um, you could actually have an entire hour-long talk on GMOs in the environment because of how complex it is. And part of that just comes from the complexity of the our environment. You have the environment within the field. You have the environment around the field. You have you know, the statewide and the global environment. So when you're looking at GMOs' effects on the environment and vice versa, pesticides are part of this habitat loss, water, air, land pollution, greenhouse gases. All of these are all intertwined together. So it's very much this mixed bag that's very hard to sort through and almost has to be done on kind of an individualistic basis. Um, so pesticides tend to be the main thing people think of with GMOs because, again, our main crops are herbicide resistant or insect resistant or disease resistant. When it comes down to GMO crops and the relationship with pesticides, the disease resistance reduces insecticidal use. Because the plant is basically vaccinated against this disease, the farmer doesn't have to go out and spray every day or every other day to try to prevent that flying insect from feeding on it and wiping out his entire crop. So they've greatly reduced insecticides with regards to the use of disease resistance modifications. Um, the same thing when it comes to our BT crops. So um, I have a local farmer who grows non-BT sweet corn. And as soon as his sweet corn starts tasseling, he sprays uh, a chemical every three days until he harvests. Um, and it's just a matter of he sells direct to market. Consumers don't want worms like this little corn ear worm down here in their ear, corn. And the only way he can guarantee that he doesn't do that is to spray every three days. So by having a BT, protein made into that corn, he doesn't have, he wouldn't have had to worry about spraying. If the, the caterpillar got in there, it would eat a little and it would die. So we've greatly reduced our insecticide use through GMO crops in that aspect. The one aspect where they have unfortunately increased is when you do this herbicide resistance. And what ends up happening is you're increasing, but you're increasing in a very selective herbicide and you're decreasing in all of your other herbicides. Um, you're going to use the herbicide that you have the resistance to because that was the point of buying the resistance seed. So you can see on the graph here, this is done from the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, they hold the Pesticide National Synthesis Project. Um, and you can go onto their website and you can pull up graphs from pretty much most of our major pesticides and see. So and that's not just herbicides, that's insecticides and fungicides as well. And you can see their breakdown in agricultural crops. Um, the one thing that they don't do is they don't take into consideration any of the ornamental ones. So, for instance, this all of these numbers um, with regards to millions of pounds would be raised if you included uh, horticulture crops like grass in particular. So, if you took into consideration homeowner use, golf course, um, sports arenas, all of that, because a lot of them use glyphosate as well. So, um, but it is kind of uh, a good resource, again, if you're looking for this data, but you can see that since uh, Roundup Ready crops, mainly corn and soybean, have hit the market, we have had a dramatic increase in the use of glyphosate. So 
that comes back to not everything is a black and white picture here, though. So we've increased select herbicides. So glyphosate is the most commonly thought of, but there are a wider variety of herbicide-resistant crops now. So uh, Liberty Link soybeans, which uses Liberty. You have the Camba ones as well. So when you're coming to them and if you're choosing to use them, one of the components we would talk about is picking one that has taken into consideration the toxicity of your herbicide. So definitely go with one that has an herbicide that's as least toxic as possible. Um, the flip side to herbicide resistant GMO crops is why you are spraying more herbicides is that it's allowing farmers to increase no-till, which is really good for our soil health. It's reducing the erosion. So particularly here in Maryland where I live, that's really useful at helping to save the Chesapeake Bay um, because farmers aren't going out and tilling um, and potentially may not even be applying that much herbicide once the crop fills in, they're reducing their greenhouse gas. So they're not running their tractors as much. They're not knocking up that soil. Plants can stay in the soil longer, so they're taking up more carbon. Um, you're also, with no-till, you use less water. So we're being a little bit more conservationist. So while there's more chemicals necessary getting applied out there, you also have some of these flip side of some environmental goods that are coming out of it. So that's when, again, this comes to, this isn't kind of a black and white. There's very much a gray. This is a complicated issue. Um, one of the environmental issues people always bring up is when you decrease the amount of weeds that are found in fields, you are really limiting um, habitat. And particularly, a lot of people are saying monarch butterflies in particular, like, you used to be fine to milkweed sometimes in soybean fields, and now you're not finding it as much because farmers are spraying and they're killing it out. So butterflies don't have as much food now. Um, on the flip side, you're also getting an increase in yield because you can plant plants closer. So this is allowing farmers to kind of take some cropland out and put it into conservation zones that monarch butterflies can have milkweed and butterfly weed and native plants in. So again, there's flip sides in all of this. It's just a matter of we have to manage everything the best way that we possibly can. Um, so the other big thing that people always talk about when they talk about GMO crops is resistance and resistance buildup. Um, so whenever you are using any kind of chemical uh, over and over and over again, resistance is going to build up, whether this is with a GMO crop or a conventional one that you were just constantly spraying over and over again. This, uh, the use of the same chemical in both settings has greatly increased resistance to weeds and to insects um, towards this. So if you look up here at the picture, this is a weed that has basically been applied the normal label of glyphosate and then multiples that are even higher and higher and higher and you're just seeing like it's slowly at six times the rate, it's still alive and it's just built up so much resistance to it. And some of that resistance could be, it was in a GMO field and it was getting applied herbicide over and over again. And then the one in the field may have made it with one that was on a golf course that was getting sprayed glyphosate out of a can as well. So you can get multiple overlaps in this. Um, so this is definitely something that needs to get considered whenever you're planting GMO crops and you need to have a plan. Um, they're a tool, but they should be used effectively. Um, and again, you really need to instill good integrated pest management and good best management practices as well um, with it. So how that leads me to how do we prevent resistance from happening? So how do we prolong this as much as possible and or um, so your best management practices are really going to be key. Um, so keeping your equipment clean um, and when you're buying seeds, buying them from a really good refuge person who's going to make sure that they don't have weed seeds in there. So just not spreading weeds around. Rotating crops is a really key issue here. A lot of times certain crops can outcompete weeds that other ones can't. Um, the use of cover crops is also key. If possible, you should keep as much as plants on your soil as much as possibly you can throughout the entire year, because that will really limit down your weeds. Um, cover crops will outcompete those weeds, particularly in the fall and the spring when your main crops aren't there, and then you can kill them down really quickly and plant your main crop in, and then your main crop can take off before those weeds do. Um, 
And you also just need to monitor for pests. You can't really combat something once it's already outbroken in your fields. You need to find it before it does. And this is where, again, integrated pest management comes into play. Um, refuge strips are a great way to prevent resistance. This is particularly common when it comes to the BT crops, so things like cotton and corn. Um, farmers used to plant strips of non-GMO cotton and corn around their fields or in the middle of the fields. And the idea is that particularly the moss pests, so things like the bull weevil or the corn earworm, you'd have some that would live on these non-GMO ones. They wouldn't build up this tolerance, and then they would mate with the ones that had built up tolerance. And it keeps lowering the resistance um, or holding the resistance steady. Um, you can also make sure that when you are using chemicals, you are rotating them. So when you are not necessarily using the specific one that the crop has been modified for, rotate to something that has a completely different mode of action. And what that's going to do is just like when we use prescription drugs or antibiotics, you're, you're going to constantly, it's the likelihood of something becoming resistant to multiple things all at the same decreases it. Um, the upcoming use of precision ag can really also help prevent resistance by really targeting in and site targeting particularly things like weeds. Um, so there is kind of some thoughts with GMOs in the society. Um, you have a lot of people who don't like GMOs and it's not necessarily any of the science that bothers them, it's just the social aspect of it. So a lot of people will say something like, I don't like GMOs because they're monoculture. Um, and lots of crops are grown as monocultures, not just GMOs. So most of your conventionals will also be done. Um, there's also kind of the dislike for the chemical companies. It feels really shady when you are buying seeds and chemicals from the same company. It's this, well, I'm going to sell you this fun toy, but then I'm going to make you buy all the accessories from me as well. And it comes down to this, which one are they making? They're making money off of both, but you can't use the one without the other. So they're kind of double dipping. And again, from a business standpoint, they're not the only companies that do this, but uh, they're kind of more visual about doing it. There's also kind of a fear and a lack of understanding. Again, you have people that just think, well, my food doesn't have DNA in it, and GMO food does. Um, so that kind of fear and understanding can kind of make people hesitant to even consider these. Um, and especially here in the United States, food is very much a comfort thing. Um, you don't go to the grocery store and say, what am I going to buy so that I don't starve? You go to the grocery store and say, what, am I, what do I want to eat? What would I like to eat? So we think of food very much as a comfort issue. So when you start hearing about things being tampered with with something you're comfortable with, it can leave people in an uneasy feeling. Um, so the seed saving component kind of plays into this. This is another thing that a lot of people are very upset um, with regards to GMOs. And, and basically, while GMOs are protected under patent laws, lots of your non-GMO varieties are as well. So if you're a company and you have spent years and years crossbreeding to get a you know, salt tolerant sorghum or a higher producing winter wheat, you don't want um, people to be saving that seed. You want them to be buying it because you need to recuperate the cost of all of that. So you can put a patent on those as well. Um, and what these patents basically do is they don't allow you to save seeds for planting the next year. Um, when you go to buy seeds, they will be very clearly labeled on the label that says they are protected. Your person who is selling them to you should also let you know. Um, if you're really interested in learning more about seed saving and seed saving laws, the University of Maryland Agriculture Law Education Initiative has just put up uh, an article about it. So you can go read about that. Um, so if you don't want to eat GMOs, you don't have to, is the good news. Um, there are enough people and enough farmers that are willing to grow food in multiple different ways that you don't have to eat this. So that is the good side of it. If you are still unsure or just not comfortable with all of the aspects of it, that's okay. 
Um, GMOs are not allowed in organic in any way, shape, or form. So you can always buy organic. Um, things like the self-labeling non-GMO project is really good. Um, this way, companies can decide if they want to be labeled or not. Um, when it comes to GMO labeling, it's going to probably have to be a nationwide initiative. This idea of state by state is just not likely going to happen. Large companies are not going to make different labels for other things. So the company is either going to decide they want to be known as non-GMO and self-label, or if they're not, um, they're, they're not going to do it until it's a nationwide initiative. If you do buy local at a farmer's market, ask your farmer. Um, a lot of farmers particularly will happily tell you, yes, I grow GMOs, here's why. No, I don't grow GMOs, here's why. Um, and you can always grow your own, which I think is always the funnest thing to do. You never really appreciate the time and energy that goes into food until you grow your own. And, you know, you should always get your hands dirty. Um, I do want to put a disclaimer that, again, you can't modify something that doesn't have DNA. So things like water and salt. Um, I have gone to stores and had literally USDA organic water on the shelf. Uh, water doesn't have anything in it, it's just water, it really can't be organic or GMO'd or anything like that, and the same thing with salt. So please do not fall for these sort of, in that case that is literally a marketing thing um, that's going on. So uh, in conclusion, some kind of key points that I want you guys to remember. Genetic modification is a tool, um, again, they're, they're not all the same. You can Say, I'm completely comfortable with the disease, I'm completely comfortable with the stress, but I don't like the herbicide, I don't like the insecticide, and that's okay. Um, when it comes to your feelings about GMOs, they're yours. Um, this is a really complex issue. As you saw, I only literally hit the tip of the iceberg. You could have multiple, multiple hour long, um, or hour and a half as we're not getting on talks about this. Um, there will probably be continuing tests for the health and environmental effects of GMOs just as, as we're testing between contradictory tests going on and more questions getting asked, it's going to be a continuing area to look at. And especially with things like the new CRISP technology coming out, it's a whole brand new opportunity for genetic engineering, both in the medical field as well as in our food field. Um, thank you guys so much for sticking around. My email address is right there. And if anyone has any questions, I will take them. Thank you, Emily. That was awesome. So informative. Um, really appreciate you breaking that down for us. We do have a question from Anthony. He was wondering if there are any long-term plans for research, say a 10 to 20 year time frame on genetically modified crop safety and risk to humans, animals, and the environment. That was his first question, then I'll ask you the second. So there have been some people who have done reviews on long-term kind of animal feeding with regards to GMOs. So again, with the bulk amount of our corn and soybean being GMO'd and it being produced to go to animals, you can definitely find some papers that would talk about, you know, we looked at animal health of cows over the past 10 years um, and saw, you know, these sort of situations. Um, the ones that I have know of, um, that I can send to you did not find anything significantly different between the cows that were fed and were not found GMOs. Um, but that's not to say that there's not some paper out there that may have found something different. Again, um, I kind of say go back to kind of wine and coffee, where you can Google is wine healthy for you, and you're going to get five different sites that say it's horrible for you, and five that say it's got health benefits. So. Um, unfortunately, science is precise and imprecise at the same time. But there have definitely been some sort of long-term reflective studies with regards to animals. Um, you also have kind of researchers that have done reflective studies looking at human health. Obviously, you can't isolate a bunch of people and, you know, experiment on them. We just don't allow that. But what you do have is people who have basically said, they're looking at populations that have eaten GMOs and have fed GMOs in the market, mainly here in the United States and Canada, and compare them to people in, say, like the EU, which has been very held back on their use of them. And while the EU is now allowing GMOs to be sold there, they're very much more restrictive. 
So there are definitely some studies where they're cross comparing, say, like medical issues that are happening there. The issue is, is that how do you narrow down that it's GMOs and not just general lifestyle changes? You know, uh, we tend to eat a lot more processed food here in America versus in Europe. So how, how do you know if it's the GMO or if it's just processed food or exercise or, you know, smoking or drinking or one of those other ones? So there are those studies, but they're not quite, they're more reflective uh, surveys than studies. I think there have been talks about kind of doing long-term, you know, more design studies, but it comes down to a funding issue. Um, you know, doing any one of these small-scale seeding things can take hundreds of thousands of dollars. So to do a prolonged 10, 20-year study with um, seed animals, you're talking a huge amount of money and commitment that not, you're not necessarily going to find maybe a researcher who's willing to commit the next 20 years of their professional life to. Um, I'm sure there might be some coming up. There are none that I know of, though, besides kind of these proactive review papers. Thank you, Emily. Um, his other question was regarding uh, clarifying the difference between genetically modified and genetically engineered um, organisms, if any. So a lot of times people will use them interchangeably. Um, most of the times in a more scientific setting, modification um, would be defined as any organism that has been modified in a genetic sense versus engineering would be ones that have uh, genes edited by people and specifically having like new genes added in. Um, most of the time, because they do get used interchanged a lot within kind of particularly um, public setting, uh, you want to see, hopefully they define what they're meaning by them. A lot of times they get used interchanged in very scientific senses. Sometimes people will differentiate between them. If you ever meet someone who is a genetic engineer, they want to call it genetic engineering. Um, but it, yeah, there's not necessarily like a cut dry between the two. Thank you. Um, we have also, Terry didn't have a question, but just wanted to compliment you on your webinar. She said it was very comprehensive. Thanks, Terry. You're doing what is my self esteem. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Okay. Well, again, if you guys think of any that you have later on, my email address is there. Um, you're more than welcome to send me an email if you would like potentially any of the uh, government documents that I have talked about, I can either send you saved PDFs I have of them or help you find them online. Um, again, the information is out there. It's very scientific and technical, um, but it is there someplace. So, um, and I'm more than happy to kind of answer more questions about this. Thank you so much, Emily. You really distilled down a very complex topic, so we appreciate you for that. And I guess if there aren't any more questions, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording for the webinar. And, you know, we look forward to seeing you guys hopefully on the 19th for 